Okay, great. Um, I, okay, great. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at our um, seminar. Uh, we have a very exciting program today. We have a three-part three series. Um, I'm presenting the first part on uh, study design of biomedical um, research studies. And then uh, Ji Chen is going to present um, some introductory statistical methods uh, um, with, uh, with some practical examples in SAS and R. Um, and then Dan Gunderson is going to be presenting um, structural equations modeling um, in, in his part of the talk. So um, my name is Clement Ma. I'm a statistician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and also uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm very pleased to um, present here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some design principles for biomedical research studies. So to start, um, there's a wide range of uh, different preclinical and clinical research studies in oncology today. Um, and really, each type of study has their own, uh, have their own specific design requirements. And um, just thinking through this, this talk, I wanted to um, give a more broad overview of some general design and statistical principles um, for biomedical research studies. So study design um, is really the specific plan or protocol um, for conducting a research study. Um, and it's very important to have a uh, well-written, well-thought-out study design um, because poorly designed studies um, uh, may end up, uh, you may not be able to answer the scientific questions um, that you're, you're trying to address in your study. Um, a poorly designed study can also introduce bias in, in the results and may lead to uh, false positive results. Um, and I think the key part is that um, while you can change the statistical analysis kind of after the data have been collected, um, you know, changing the analysis won't really rescue a poorly designed study. So this is something that, as an investigator, you want to make sure you think about right from the beginning. So in general, um, I would say there would be five steps that you want to um, consider when uh, trying to design a study. Um, first, you want to think about your study objectives and your endpoints, the, the measurements that you're going to be making. Um, we want to be careful in defining our study population. Uh, and then we're going to basically select the experimental design, and there's different pieces that you may want to consider in your particular study. Um, and then next, you would want to calculate uh, an appropriate sample size for your study so that you'll have enough information, enough power, to answer the question that you're trying to address. And then finally, um, writing out the statistical methods in a very clear analytic plan is also very important. So let's start with the first piece, um, defining the study objectives. So these objectives really pose the scientific questions um, to be addressed in your study. And in general, a, a study should have a one primary objective and a number of secondary and exploratory objectives. Um, you would want the objectives to be clear, concise, specific, and most importantly, quantifiable, something that you could measure objectively. Um, when you're trying to write the objectives, you may consider some keywords uh, um, to determine, to estimate, evaluate, describe, identify, or compare. And there are, there are other words you may want to uh, use. But generally, um, a study aim or objective would begin with a statement to determine x, to estimate something. Um, and if you think more broadly, uh, we can kind of split objectives into two general classes, um, descriptive ob objectives and comparative objectives. So for descriptive objectives, um, our goal here is to estimate a parameter of interest in the study population. Um, so it might be trying to estimate the survival rate of, of your population or um, whether your treatment is, has a good response rate. Um, we also want to um, estimate a measure of precision that is associated with this estimate. So um, like a standard deviation, um, range, 95% confidence interval, for example. For descriptive objectives, generally there will be no formal hypothesis or statistical testing. You're not going to um, run a comparison. Uh, it's just really describing uh, your, your data using an estimate. 
So some examples um, to identify the number of copy number variants in a certain population in a certain gene, um, to describe the overall survival of patients diagnosed with a certain disease, uh, to assess the feasibility of conducting a survey in patients with X. Now, in comparison, for comparative objectives, um, the goal here is to compare a certain outcome or endpoints uh, between groups um, or compare the outcome that you measure in your study versus some historical control or some threshold. Um, and, and in this case, you would want to perform some type of statistical test and then um, calculate a measure of statistical significance. It could be a p-value, q-value, posterior probability. So some examples um, to identify the genetic variants associated with disease X or to determine if the treatment response is higher in patients treated with drug A versus drug B. So I wanted to give some uh, examples of objectives and um, kind of examples that we want to make some improvements on, give some commentary, and then um, maybe suggest an alternative objective. So in the first case, um, on the left, there's an objective to determine if the drug improves patient outcomes. Um, so, you know, the question would be, what are these outcomes that we're trying to improve? Um, and how are we going to quantify this improvement? Um, so is it simply yes or no, you know, the, the, the patient improved or not based on the threshold? Or are we looking at a continuous measure of outcome? They have 20% um, better survival at five years, or um, they have 10 points higher on their quality of life score. So, um, you know, an improvement to the, this objective could be to determine if patients in treatment arm A have a higher event-free survival than those in treatment arm B. So, uh, event-free survival is that outcome that we're going to be comparing between the treatment arms. So, here's an, uh, another example. Um, to characterize changes in patient quality of life after treatment. So, um, the question would be, what time points are we comparing between, and how are we going to quantify the change? Is this an absolute difference in, in the change, or is it a percentage difference? Um, so an, an alterna uh, alternative objective would be to characterize the percentage change in the total quali quality of life score from baseline to 12 weeks after treatment. So this would be an example of a descriptive objective. And then finally, uh, this is something that I, I see very often when working with investigators, uh, to compare the T-cell, B-cell, and cytokine profiles at four weeks, 12 weeks, six months, and one year. So um, basically, th there's too many objectives, too many outcomes in a single objective. Uh, it's, um, and when we say compare, we need to specify what the comparison groups are. So the improved objective would be to compare the number of CD4 and CD8 T cells at four weeks, 12 weeks, six months, and one year between wild type and mutant mice. So these are just some examples. I mean, um, in your own research study, you have to think about um, what makes sense for, for your own study. So for the primary objective, this is your main scientific question um, that you want to address in your uh, study. And generally, the primary ob objective will determine the study design and sample size. So you're going to um, design the study around the primary objective. Um, specifically for comparative objectives, um, I would generally recommend that you have a single primary objective that compares a single endpoint or outcome between groups. Because um, if you have additional objectives or outcomes within the primary objective, then you would need to control for multiple comparisons. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later. Now for secondary and exploratory objectives, um, these are some additional scientific questions that you want to investigate. Um, but they're different from the primary objective as that they, they're more for hypothesis generation, for future studies, or simply to collect data so you, you can design a future study. Um, but it's still important to specify how you're going to measure and evaluate these secondary and exploratory outcomes. You, you still want to follow the same um, principles for all objectives. And again, we want to avoid excessive numbers of secondary and exploratory, exploratory objectives um, because you might 
encounter multiple testing problem. Um, in general, we would, we would suggest that you still assess power for these secondary or exploratory objectives using the sample size that you've determined from your um, calculation for the primary objective. So do you have sufficient power to address all these additional objectives given a certain sample size? All right, so next we need to think about the out outcomes that you're going to measure or the endpoints. Um, these are the events or characteristics that can be objectively measured within each study subject. So what we want to define is um, when the outcome will be measured, how it will be measured, what assay, what survey, um, you know, how, what is the method of measurements. Um, it's important to think about uh, the type of outcome that you're going to get. What kind of result will you get after you measure this? Is, will, this will this be a, a binary outcome, yes or no, present or absent? Um, is it ordinal? So these are kind of ordered categories, um, such as uh, low, medium, high. Um, a continuous outcome or change over time. So there are many types, but it, the type of outcome will really determine the type of analysis that you're going to do at the end. So it's good to think about this um, when you're writing the objectives and the outcomes. And also good to uh, note that what are the units of measure um, for, for these outcomes. So uh, I want to again present a couple um, endpoints as examples. Um, the first one is um, treatment response rate. Um, now, this is a rate, so it's a proportion. It ranges from 0 to um, 100 percent in your study population. So um, this is something that you measure across the population. It's not something you measure per study subject. Um, and we want to be careful. When you say treatment response, how do you, quali um, how do you determine whether a certain subject has responded or not? So, um, uh, alternative um, would be something more specific. So treatment response, it's a binary uh, endpoint, as defined as um, greater than or equal to six out of eight weeks with platelet counts um, greater than this threshold during weeks five to 12 of therapy. So it's very clear if you achieve this, you're, you're a responder to the treatment, and if you fail this um, definition, you're not a responder. So um, this is something that you want to be very careful when you define it. Because the worst thing that would happen is you've collected a lot of data, and when you get to analyze it, you can't exactly determine who is responding or not. And you don't want to be changing the definition as you go when you do the analysis. So second, um, event-free survival, EFS. Uh, so again, EFS is a proportion measured for the whole population, um, not for a single individual or a subject. Um, for any survival outcomes, you need to think about what the starting time point is. Are you measuring from date of diagnosis, from date of surgery, or maybe another time point? And then for the events, wh which events are included? So um, an alternative endpoint would be um, time to date of diagnosis to progression, relapse, or death. So those are your events. Um, or to date of last follow-up if the pat uh, patient was alive. Um, and then you would go on to define what is a progression and what is a relapse. So it's very clear when you go to analyze it how you can actually calculate it, um, this event-free survival. So finally, um, let's say you're interested in patient distress. So um, the first question is, how are you going to measure distress? And when this dis distress measurement will, will, be, will be taken? So um, the improvement or the suggestion would be uh, the total distress score at three months as measured by the Memorial uh, Symptom Assessment Scale. So something uh, very specific and something that we can uh, measure very clearly. Okay, so the, the next step um, is to think about your study population. Who are you going to include or exclude from your study? Um, and it's very important to set your inclusion and exclusion criteria before the study starts. Um, you don't want to be changing um, kind of ad hoc uh, as you're going along. So um, with defining your inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, generally there's a, there's a balance between kind of more broader kind of general inclusion versus a very restricted inclusion uh, set of inclusion criteria. So if you have broad criteria, um, you're going to be able to accrue your subjects 
more quickly. Um, since you're looking at a more broader population, the results are more likely to be generalizable. Um, but you're going to end up with a more heterogeneous population when you go analyze it. So um, if the treatment was only uh, you know, effective in one subpopulation, having a heterogeneous population may dilute that treatment effect that you're looking for. Whereas if you have a strict uh, set of criteria, um, you're, you're going to have a harder time um, recruiting and accruing uh, uh, subjects. Um, your results may be less generalizable, but you're going to have a more homogeneous population, and you, you may have better control over confounders and uh, other uh, characteristics. And again, um, if you're changing your inclusion-exclusion criteria kind of in an ad hoc manner, um, you're going to introduce selection bias. So the selected study subjects are not really representative of the population that you're, you're trying to analyze. All right, so I'm, next I'm going to go into some um, design considerations that you may consider in your particular study. Um, so um, the first step is, you know, really, are you thinking of a prospective study where you're going to collect data as a study progresses? So on the, on the right, there's um, a, a plot. Uh, you can see the timeline. Uh, start of the study is up now, and then you're going to conduct the study moving forward into the future. Um, the key is that um, you're going to be able to measure the baseline exposures and confounders and kind of subject characteristics before the outcome has occurred. Um, so you're going to measure it before this, or at the start of the study, at baseline. And then your outcomes are measured um, kind of as you go all along. So it um, might be one, at one or more time points. So uh, the properties of prospective studies are that this usually has better measurement of exposures and potential confounders, thus reducing bias. Um, uh, you're able, to, because you're collecting data as you go forward, you're, you're probably likely to have more uniform and rigorous data collection compared to retrospective studies. Um, the, the downside is generally prospective <coughs> studies would be uh, more expensive and maybe more time consuming to conduct. So in contrast, retrospective studies, um, all of the data, the exposures, and the outcomes have already happened in the past. So you're at the start of the study, you're, you're going to look backwards in time, and you're going to capture a cohort of, of subjects where you're going to measure their exposures and their outcomes of interest. Um, this is a good design for um, generating hypotheses, uh, or when your patient population um, or outcome is rare. And it's going to take you a long time to collect many uh, subjects with this certain outcome if you go in a, pros in a prospective study. Um, they're generally inexpensive and quick to complete. Um, the downside is that um, the exposures or outcomes of your uh, subjects may be missing or inaccurate. So uh, another um, consideration you may want to uh, think about is randomization. When you ha are trying to compare a certain intervention or treatment between one or more groups, or two or more groups. So um, basically, randomization is a method to um, unpredictably assign the intervention to the study subjects. Um, and the real benefit of randomization is that it's able to balance both known and unknown factors, characteristics of your subjects, between the uh, different treatment groups. And this is one way you can reduce the selection bias. Um, and as such, uh, in randomized controlled trials for, for um, uh, drug development, this is the kind of the gold standard. This is the most reliable evidence we can have for um, intervention efficacy in humans. And there have been papers uh, in uh, kind of talking about reproduce reproducible research um, in preclinical studies where um, they recommend that randomization techniques can also be applied to, to mice studies, for example. So a successful randomization really requires two things. So we need to be able to generate a, uh, an unpredictable sequence of intervention allocations, so either treatment A or B. Um, and then we want to be able to conceal this allocation until the intervention, uh, this, until the assignment of the intervention to the patient. So we don't want to be able to predict um, which intervention the next individual will get. 
So there are several types of randomization you may consider. Um, the, the, the first one is simple randomization. Um, basically, you're going to randomize based uh, only on the allocation ratio. So let's say you want to randomize uh, one to one to two treatment groups. Then essentially, it's, it's a coin flip, 50-50. Um, so on the right, uh, I've just given uh, a series of uh, randomized allocations for two treatments, treatment A and B, to 40 uh, subjects, and um, you know, uh, generated this random string. And at the end, there were 17 subjects assigned to treatment A, and 23 subjects assigned to treatment B. It's somewhat, um, it's it's random. You, um, you're not going to get exact balance uh, between the treatment groups every time. So. The advantage of a simple randomization like this is that it's unpredictable. Um, you're not going to be able to tell what the next uh, treatment um, intervention would be. Um, and it, it's really good at reducing selection bias. However, um, as you can see, the, the, you could end up, if you're unlucky, um, end up with unbalanced numbers of subjects per group. Um, you could also end up with unbalanced um, characteristics uh, in the subjects between groups. So you may end up with more males in treatment A than, than in treatment B. And that's something you may have to control for in your analysis. And then finally, um, again, it, because it's a simple coin flip here, you may get long runs of subjects assigned to the same treatment. So you can see here, um, for, for these patients, these sequence of patients, there, there's seven individuals who got treatment B. So if for some reason you had to end the um, study early, um, you're going to have a large imbalance in your um, treatment allocation. So kind of one solution to this is a blocked randomization. So you're going to randomize within a specific block of patients, a group of patients, where you specify this. So um, in the example on the right, uh, there's, um, I've again randomized the treatments to 40 subjects, but now we have a block size of eight. So within each row, which is eight subjects, um, there's going to be a balanced number of um, treatment A or B. And then we're going to repeat this uh, kind of with each of the five blocks. So uh, the advantage here is that we ensure there's going to be roughly balanced numbers of individuals in each treatment group at any point in the trial. Um, but the disadvantage is that this will re reduce unpredictability, uh, especially if your block size is smaller. So suppose your block size was four, and um, you've already assigned two individuals to treatment B, then you can guess that the last, the patient three and four will get treatment A. And then finally, um, there's stratified randomization. Um, this is where you're going to randomize within certain strata um, defined by um, some subject characteristic. Could be age, could be gender, or in a multi-center study, it could be the, the institution that the patient is in. So um, on the example here, I've um, done a block. And usually with a stratified randomization, you would also need to um, include blocking. So uh, this is a blocked and stratified randomization. So the strata are male and female patients. Um, within each block of four, there's equal numbers of treatments. And then there's going to be equal numbers of male and female patients um, at the end of the analysis. Um, so again, the advantage here is you're going to balance these potentially prognostic factors. But again, it will reduce unpredictability. All right. So um, next is uh, sample size and power. So um, it's always necessary to consider um, and calculate the appropriate sample size when designing any study. Um, I've heard a lot of times, oh, this, this study is really just exploratory. I'm trying to gather information. Well, if exploratory, you're trying to maybe estimate a parameter. Well, let's put a confidence interval around that. How, much, how many samples do you need to have a certain precision for your parameter estimates? Um, and essentially, it's, it's really unethical to conduct an underpowered study with insufficient sample size to detect a meaningful difference between groups or to have a certain precision in your estimate. So you're going to conduct a study with five mice. Well, you know, you're not going to really be able to get, answer your question. So you're, you're kind of wasting resources and time. Um, and kind of worse is that with a small study, if you're unlucky, 
you're going to get a false positive result, and this may lead to um, a series of subsequent studies or experiments based on a false positive. So um, you really want to know that the result you're getting to make future decisions or future to design future experiments is, is solid. I mean, you want to know um, that you're basing this on, on some uh, rigorous experiment. So I'm going to again split up the sample size considerations between um, descriptive and comparative objectives. Um, and I, I'm not, I think here I'm not trying to uh, present a, a number of different um, uh, formulas for all different scenarios. I want to give kind of a conceptual um, uh, explanation of the calculation using one specific example. So in this case, um, the, uh, what we're trying to estimate is the proportion of patients with with the success. So, um, and the end point here is, is um, whether it's success or not for, for this particular uh, outcome. So, um, what you need to define is um, your expected proportion of subjects with the success, and then the kind of desired confidence interval width and the confidence level. So, um, generally you would use a 95% confidence, uh, confidence level, and then we can determine a certain confidence interval width that would be appropriate. So um, here I've calculated for different sample sizes for an observed proportion of 60% in your outcome, um, what, what the 95% confidence interval would be. So for example, for five uh, subjects, your confidence interval would be ranged from 15% to 95% um, for this estimate. And basically, it covers the whole range. So it's very imprecise. You don't have very much precision. And as you increase your sample size, you can see that the confidence interval um, size width decreases. So I want to give, give a kind of concrete example. This is a study um, I'm working on at Dana-Farber where they're trying to look at the feasibility of a communication intervention targeting the early treatment period in pediatric oncology. And the primary endpoint here is the feasibility of this intervention. And um, they defined it as whether the patient, the patient's family, completed a conversation um, with the um, primary care team during this early treatment period. So when talking to the investigator, uh, we, we, we expected that the proportion of subjects that we're looking at would have success rate of 60% or more. And we wanted a confidence interval with no greater than 35%. So if we um, did the calculation for the sample size, a sample size of 35 individuals will achieve this desired precision. So um, for a 60% observed feasibility, the confidence interval is 42% to 76%. Now there's an alternative approach that we could have used to um, kind of calculate the sample size. So um, the idea here is that we can determine the sample size so that the lower confidence limit is greater or equal to a non-promising value. And the non-promising value essentially is the kind of the minimum success rate here that you would accept for you to kind of proceed with, with the study. So um, in this case, uh, let's say that our expected proportion is still 60%. But let's say we were unlucky in, in when we collected the data, um, the observed proportion actually was actually lower than this. Well, what, what is this minimum we're looking for? So it, let's say that we wanted the success rate to be no smaller than 32%. Then we can calculate um, the sample size here. Um, so for example, with 10 individuals, the limits are 26%, 88%. So this is too low. Um, with 15 individuals, the lower confidence limit is exactly at 32%. So, so this is kind of the minimum number that we would need to kind of rule out um, a success rate lower than 32%. Now, of course, if you wanted to have a higher non-promising value, you would need a higher sample size. So um, let's say you wanted a non-promising value of 45%, then you would need 50 individuals to kind of rule out um, with 95% confidence that your feasibility rate is not less than 45%. Yes? So how do you, why do you determine one or the other? How, 
how do you make the decision that I'm going to have a non promising value of 45 or 32? And how do you do the calculation? Um, so there's, it's, it, the, the selection of the non promising value is really a discussion between the statistician and the investigator. It's kind of like if I asked you for your experiments, if you're going to kind of proceed with a subsequent experiment, what is the minimum success rate you would want to see to kind of proceed? So if in, in this experiment, in this study, they only saw that this intervention was um, successful in 10% of the patients, they would not kind of proceed to the next step. They wouldn't do another follow-up study with a larger population. So this is kind of a decision kind of for the investigator to think about. Like, if, if I saw a certain success rate, would I go forward with another study or not? And kind of thinking about this, you may want to, you know. Um, and it's, it's also a balance. I mean, you may not be able to recruit 50 individuals for your study. So, you know, this, this non-promising value is too high. So there's, there's a kind of a lot of factors playing into this. Right. That's right. So that's the next yeah. step I, I'm going to talk about. So this is just for a simple descriptive objective. So a one arm, there's no comparison. But you can also compare it versus um, a set values to say, you know, I want to make sure that it's statistically more than a certain minimum number. That's the other way to do it. Thank you. All right. So, uh, like I said, so the next next piece is uh, looking at comparative objectives. So um, here I need to kind of go into a little bit into statistics. Um, so uh, when we're trying to think about comparative objectives, we need to think about the null and alternative hypotheses. So the null hypothesis is basically the statement that you're trying to test, and the alternative is a statement that um, you're trying to hope you're tr you're hoping or expecting to be true instead of the null hypothesis. So um, let's say your objective here is to compare the mean quality of life score between the intervention group and a control group. So your null hypothesis, null hypothesis may be that um, the difference between the quality of life scores um, is zero between the two groups. And the alternative is that the difference is not zero. It's greater than or less than zero um, between the two groups. So by conducting the test, you're trying to reject the null hypothesis and show that you have evidence that the null hypothesis is not true. So we also need to think about type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, so type 1 errors are um, basically your false positive, the, the um, probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when, in fact, the null hypothesis is true. So, um, so in, in, in our example, if, if truly in nature um, there is no difference in quality of life between the intervention and the control arm, um, what is our chance for declaring it to be different? What is our error? That, that would be a false positive. Um, the flip side is a false negative. So this is type 2 error. The probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So in, in our example, if there is truly a difference between the quality of life scores between the two groups, um, what is the chance that we will not you know, declare it to be different? Um, and type 2 error is uh, tied to power, which is simply 1 minus the type 2 error rate. So power is simply the probability to detect a true positive. All right, so um, let's try to calculate the sample size for the difference between two means. So um, these are some parameters you, you would want to specify. So you need to think about the type 1 error rate. So typically, um, we, we pick 5%. You, know, you're, you need a p-value less than uh, 0 0.05. Um, as for power, uh, generally we'd say 80% power is, is fairly good. You, you may decide to have a higher or lower power depending on um, what you're willing to accept. Um, and here, uh, I'm assuming that there's equal numbers of uh, subjects in the two, um, the control and uh, intervention group. Um, you also have to think about the 
kind of difference in the mean score that is biologically or clinically meaningful. So even though, you know, you can imagine you can have a very large study that detects a difference in the score of maybe 1% or 0.5%. Um, it's statistically significant, but in the clinic, it's kind of meaningless. I mean, that's within the, the error of conducting the actual survey. Um, so you need to define your difference that you're trying to de detect based on some clinically meaningful measure. And then you also need to establish some measure of precision in measuring the outcome. So in this case, we need to specify the standard deviation um, for the outcome. And uh, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the standard deviation is equal in both groups. So um, when we calculate this, so uh, here are some examples. Uh, suppose that, excuse me, the difference in the mean score um, is 10 units. And we have different um, kind of standard deviations, uh, small, uh, 5, 10, and 15. You can see that the total sample size increases. So for small standard deviation, um, it requires only 12 individuals. But if you have a more variable measure, you're going to need more data, more subjects, to really determine, um, to detect the same difference in the means. Uh, in, in, in another scenario where we're looking at um, change, varying the um, difference in the means, but fixing the standard deviation, um, for a very small difference, a small effect size, you're going to need a big a sample size to detect the difference. Um, I want to talk a little bit about multiple comparisons. Um, so, you know, we were talking about the type 1 error rate at 5%. This means that if we conducted the study, we would expect a 5% chance that a significant result is a false positive. Now, if we end up testing many outcomes, many hypotheses, we're going to increase our chance to have a false positive result. So let's say, um, you know, in an extreme case, you're testing 100 hypotheses. So even if, you know, in, in nature, all these hypotheses are not true, um, so they're all under the null um, hypothesis, then we're going to see five statistically significant results just by chance. Um, these are going to be your false positives. So um, we want to be careful when we're designing study and um, when we're analyzing the study and adjust for multiple comparisons. So a very common approach would be to use the uh, Bonferroni um, adjustment. And the idea is you're simply dividing the significance level by the number of tests that you're performing. So let's say you're um, performing five statistical tests. Um, so instead of using a p-value threshold of 0 0.05, um, you're going to divide this by five. You're going to make it more stringent. You need a p-value less than 0 0.01 to be a statistical significant. Um, and this has been kind of, kind of broadly applied. Um, it's fairly stringent, so it's a very conservative threshold. Um, and there are some alternative methods, which I I'm not going to talk about. I just want to highlight there's a bonferroni home method and the false discovery rate. And I, I guess finally, when you're thinking about sample size, um, aside from all those statistical parameters, there's also practical limitations. So, um, how many patients you are you going to expect to lose to follow up or will have missing data, maybe for incompleteness or they don't fill out your survey. Um, so you may need to kind of expand the number of subjects you accrue so that after deleting these missing data, you're going to have the appropriate sample size to address your um, uh, study objectives. Um, Sample size may be uh, limited also by the availability of subjects, the, the very slow accrual rate, and also your study budget. So um, you can, it's, uh, to me, sample size calculation is more of an art than a science. You really have to talk to the investigator, figure out the limitations, and kind of find the right balance between having enough subjects and running the study in, in like a practical, um, time-efficient manner. So the last piece um, is writing the analytic plan. Um, we want to make sure we define the statistical methods for each objective before we start the study. Um, and it's also important to define the analytic cohort for each objective, which subsets of the subjects will be analyzed. I mean, it may be clear, maybe all the subjects for all your objectives, but if you're looking at subgroup analyses, 
um, which subgroups are you going to be analyzing. It's also important to uh, define any stopping rules that may end the study early. Um, so for example, you may decide to uh, stop the study if you see that a certain intervention is much more um, uh, successful than the other, than, than the control uh, intervention, for example. And you also want to specify any planned interim analyses. So if you're going to stop in the middle of your data collection and do kind of interim analyses, um, this may lead to an inflated type 1 error rates, um, and you would have to adjust for multiple comparisons accordingly. So just some examples of writing um, the analytic uh, plan. Um, so one objective to compare the mean quality of life score. So the analytic plan will be the two-sided student's t-test will be used to compare the mean quality of life score between intervention and control groups. Um, and for our feasibility outcome, our objective, um, we can say that the proportion and 95% confidence interval of patients for which the intervention was administered will be um, calculated. So in summary, um, careful study design is critical to the success of biomedical research studies. Um, we, investigators need to think about um, defining the study objectives, the outcomes, the study population, selecting an appropriate experimental design, um, calculating the sample size and power, and then defining the analytic plan. Thanks very much. Happy to take any questions at this time.